Good morning, Tabernacle Baptist Church. I am so glad you have decided to join us this morning uh, as we have a unique and unusual time of worship together. I hope that you have taken advantage of some of the opportunities we've given to you to be able to worship together as a family, and now we look forward to being able to spend time together in God's Word. I am amazed even just sitting here knowing that we are doing this. I would not have imagined even just 48 hours ago that it would have come to this point where we would have felt the need to cancel our services and uh, provide this option for our time of worship together. In fact, I don't recall another time in the life of our nation where there has been such a national crisis, with the exception of perhaps 9-11. I think we find ourselves in a unique day and in a unique time and so I think it's important that as we find ourselves in this context, in this environment, that we take time and we think carefully about what's going on, and in particularly that we think theologically, biblically, that we make sure that we're falling back on our commitments and our belief in God and His grace and His sovereignty, regardless of the circumstances that we may be facing so in order to have a time in God's Word together today, I'm going to take us to a passage of Scripture that is familiar to most of you. Perhaps you have already been reading in it, and my guess is I am not the only pastor in the country who is addressing this text today. But I do find it instructive. I think it provides us some helpful guidance as we think about how we as believers and as a church will respond in our community to this situation. Uh, I would encourage you to get a Bible, if you don't have one with you, and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to read together verses 4 through 9, and then we're going to take an opportunity to reflect on what God's Word means for us today. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. These words Paul is bringing to a conclusion this letter to the church that he wrote in Philippi. And this letter is full of a number of encouragements to, uh, to think carefully about God and His promises and the impact the gospel should have on our lives. It is fitting, then, that as Paul brings this letter to a conclusion, that he does so by drawing our attention to what be, would be some essential ways that we can respond to the circumstances around us. And so as we think about Philippians 4, 4 through 9, I, I have four encouragements to you, perhaps even four commands. Uh, ways that we can respond to the time that we find ourselves in now. Number one, I think Paul encourages us to be joyful. Uh, that, that verse, verse 4, it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing uh, unusual about it. There's nothing difficult about it. It is a simple, straightforward command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. It has been said by many that the letter to the church in Philippi focuses on joy as its primary message. Indeed, you find joy coming up again and again in this book. Paul regularly commends them to, uh, to, to find confidence and assurance in God and His promises. If you were to go back just a page or so at the beginning of chapter 3, this very command is, is issued with one exception. Chapter 3 begins with the command, Rejoice in the Lord. As Paul comes back to it, he then adds the word, Rejoice in the Lord, always. Always. 
Now, I think it's important that we understand what Paul has in mind here when he talks about rejoicing. When he talks about joy, this is not some kind of emotion. Uh, This is not based on one's circumstances. In fact, I think you can argue that this is in spite of one's circumstances, and that often joy is that which we experience even in contradiction to our emotions. Joy is more properly understood as having an absolute confidence, an assurance in God, in His presence, and in His promises to us. In other words, joy, or the command to rejoice in the Lord always, is driven by one's theology, by what we believe about God. God being sovereign, God being good, God being just, God being kind and loving, that God is all present and that God is all powerful. These qualities of God are the qualities we fall back on when we find ourselves in need of of assurance and confidence. And when Paul says to rejoice in the Lord always, he certainly doesn't mean that we experience joy because of all of our circumstances. But it does mean that regardless of our circumstance, we can rejoice in the Lord. It is, in fact, a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is a gift of the gospel itself. And so I would commend to you then this instruction as as we think about the day we find ourselves in, that one way we respond is that we are joyful. And I would remind you that as Paul is giving us this encouragement, he's not doing so from a place of peace and ease. He's not writing these words while uh, while relaxing in in some palatial and spacious manner. He's he's not uh, feeling the good days of life. Instead, Paul is in prison. Paul is chained to a Roman guard. This Roman guard would change about every six hours, but 24 hours a day he is chained. And we can tell from the words of Philippians, Paul is not even certain what will come of this imprisonment because he he encourages the church in Philippi by saying, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul knows what it means to be in in need. He knows what it means to face anxiety and and worry and and fear. And, And This is nothing new for him. In fact, the church in Philippi was started as Paul and his traveling companion Silas were in prison in Philippi for preaching the gospel, and in the middle of the night they start to sing. They start to rejoice in the Lord, and in so doing, we see this mighty move of God. The prison doors are open, their shackles fall off, And even the Roman guard, as a result of all of these circumstances, becomes a believer. His whole house believes. Some of the first members of the church in Philippi come because of Paul's rejoicing in the Lord. So that's what I would commend to you first, that you would rejoice in the Lord. Be joyful. Number two, I would also encourage you to be gracious. Be gracious. Listen there in verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now that word that the New King James translates as gentleness is also translated as graciousness, forbearance, or reasonableness. Now what's interesting is that this this word then with, with so many different translations, that gives us some idea that Paul is speaking about this general disposition of life. When he when he encourages us to be gentle. He is encouraging us to be kind, to be patient, to to, to reach out to those who are around us in in the proper spirit, to make sure that the way we relate to one another is not with just some kind of selfish intent, but to look out for the well-being of others. I find it interesting also that Paul says, let your gentleness be known to all men. This should be the testimony of God's people. This should be our witness That as we are relating to one another, as we are relating to our neighbors, as we are out in public, that there is a certain, again, gentleness or graciousness about us, a kindness, a compassion. And really, is there any time where this is more needed than in a time of crisis? How easy is it when, when we find ourselves worried and anxious and concerned, when there is uncertainty, that, that we tend to turn toward ourselves and 
And especially if we find ourselves in this kind of environment, maybe even where greater quarantine measures may be called for, I think it will be incumbent upon us that we, we commit ourselves to being gracious. And I would suggest this, in fact, is the testimony the church has generally shown to the community around her. And just think about the natural disasters that happen, not only in our country, but around the world. Who is it that responds first? Who is it that is in the homes and in the communities who reaches out to these who are devastated by storms and by floods? It is the church. Well, we've probably all thought about this and asked these questions. What would happen in any given community if in the midst of a natural disaster, the churches decided to not respond to it? It would be devastating. And undoubtedly that these volunteer efforts by churches in the midst of crisis saves communities millions and millions of dollars. And so I would just commend this to you once again, Tabernacle, that we would be mindful of the expectation that we would not only be joyful, but that we would be gentle, gracious, kind, and compassionate. And Paul motivates this behavior because he adds this last phrase, the Lord is at hand. There's some debate about the phrase. Some suggest this is pointing to the second coming of Christ and that, in fact, we live in light of that day, that, that the, the day would come quickly and, and w- would happen at any moment, so we need to be prepared. The Lord is at hand. And while that certainly is an implication, I, I'm inclined to see the phrase as being just much more personal and intentional to say, God is with us. Christ is in us. He is at hand. And so we can trust in Him. We can trust in His presence in our lives. So, as we are gracious and as we are gentle, as we are kind, we know that the Lord is at hand with us. So be joyful. Be gracious. Number three, be prayerful. Be prayerful. Perhaps the most famous verse of all of this is going to be found in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let your request be made known to God. And so Paul uses these familiar words, words that perhaps we've memorized, uh, words that we have said over and over again, that, that one way we respond to this kind of crisis is we do so with prayer. Now, I would encourage you with this phrase. When Paul begins by saying, be anxious for nothing, He is not assuming that you'll be able to banish worry and anxiety from your life from now and forevermore. Instead, I think the verse implies that you and I will face worrisome times. We will face anxious times. And so when that does come our way, the encouragement to us is to be anxious for nothing. That doesn't mean that the circumstances aren't worthy of consideration, that there are not things that require serious and careful thought, that some of our problems and difficulties uh, wouldn't be a burden on the heart. Instead, it just means trust that God will provide for you. God will meet every single one of your needs in Christ Jesus. And so, no matter what the situation is, that in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let these requests be made known to God. And then the promise that comes is that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice what Paul does not say. If you pray in the midst of these situations, he does not say, and the the peace of God will remove all of your anxiety and worrisome situations. Instead, he says, he will guard your hearts and your minds. In other words, through the gospel, through the presence of Christ, through God's goodness to us, and by his spirit, he guards our hearts and minds. He helps give us focus. He helps give us confidence in the midst of what may be really difficult situations. And so, Paul's commendation to us is well taken. One of the ways we respond to this kind of critical situation is that we're prayerful. There's no need to keep from God whatever may be on your heart, whatever may be worrying you, whatever may be causing anxiety. Instead, bring them to Him in faith and confidence, 
that he will guard your heart, and knowing that he will provide you with all that you need to endure whatever circumstance he is bringing you through. So spend time during this time in prayer. Along those lines, I would commend to you then that you would be in prayer. Be in prayer with your family and for your family. Pray for your church. Pray for your community. Pray for your nation. I, I join our president in calling you to this day of prayer and using it as an opportunity to call out to God, being mindful of a particular Christian response to this. And that is not only asking for God's intervention, but also perhaps seeking God in repentant and humble prayer. May this be an opportunity that we focus on what matters the most. Often that is one of the biggest benefits of a crisis. It causes us to reassess our priorities and to think, again, biblically and theologically about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So be joyful, be gracious, be prayerful. Finally, be mindful. Be mindful. I think Paul concludes this section by encouraging us to be very careful about that which influences the way that we think. He calls on us to meditate, to think on those things that are worthy of being thought on. So again, notice verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, we won't take time to unpack every single one of those words. I really think what Paul is doing here is painting for us a general picture that, that we should be giving our thoughts. We should be allowing our minds to be influenced and formed and fashioned by those things that are worthwhile, beneficial, pure, that are consistent with God's Word. Uh, th those things that build up. In fact, it would be those things that would build up uh, confidence in God, that would build up graciousness and patience, those things that would encourage joy in the Lord. Spend time meditating on the right things. A and, and in this context, I think this instruction is important. Because undoubtedly in the days to come, we are going to be exposed to all kinds of news and information, and I would encourage you to you know, remain uh, in touch with information, and we, we don't want to be oblivious to the things that are going on around us. However, know that the news sources are not designed to encourage you to be less anxious. They're not designed to encourage you to know the peace of God. So as, as you're keeping yourself aware of the, the events, and as the, these events are changing rapidly and ever-evolving, manage how much these sources are influencing your thinking. Manage how much the, the words of men are determining how you view the course of events. Do not forget that no matter what may be going on in the world around us, our God is is in charge. He is sovereign. All things happen according to the counsel of his will, Paul tells us in the opening of Ephesians. He is to be trusted. So let us give ourselves to thinking very clear thoughts about God and his goodness, even in the midst of these challenging times. So give yourself to thinking about the right things. And then I love how this ends. Paul goes on to say, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And then he gives this promise, and the God of peace will be with you. I love that bookend. It connects us back to what he said in verse 7. After encouraging us to bring our prayers and supplications to the Lord and saying that the peace of God will guard our hearts, then he commends to us the God of peace who will be with us. Clearly, these two ideas are connected. But the means by which you and I enjoy the peace of God is the fact that God is the God of peace. The means by which we enjoy confidence that God is, is, is loving us and concerned about us and is able to manage 
the day-to-day affairs of our lives, this, this peace in who God is and how he's involved in our lives, this comes to us because he is the God of peace. He's not only the God who grants peace in circumstances, he is a God who has granted us peace with himself. Paul's words are really taking us straight back to the gospel itself. The reason you and I can know the peace of God is because the God of peace has made it possible that we are right with Him. Because He in His goodness and grace allowed His one and only Son to bear in His body His wrath against our sin. That that in Christ, in, in placing our faith in Him and in His crucifixion and His resurrection and receiving this good work of Christ on our behalf, we can have our unrighteousness forgiven, and we're made right with God. The Bible makes it clear again and again that the gospel gives us peace with Him. The God of peace grants us peace, not only with Him, but because we have peace with Him. We can have peace in the midst of any of these other circumstances. And so again, the instruction to us, I think, is simple. And my, my closing words then to you are, are just these, these that we have gone through as we think about the days to come. Be joyful. Be gracious. Be prayerful. Be mindful. Trust that the peace of God is available to you because of the God of peace. We can trust Him with whatever the days may bring our way because our days are in His hand. So to the believer, I would encourage you, allow this to be an opportunity, not only where you once again draw strength from God and His Word and the truths about Him, but that you are an effective witness in the world around us. The world around us does not know this peace. We know this peace. So may we share with them, may we show them what it looks like when people walk through tragedy with confidence. Of course, I would also make an appeal to anybody who may be watching whether you're a part of the Tabernacle family or whether you've just found us through some other means, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, I would implore you, humble yourself before God. Confess that you are a sinner. Trust that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Ask God to forgive you based on what Christ and Christ alone has done for you. And you can be made right with God. And you can know true hope and true peace. Again, church, thank you for the opportunity we've had today to be able to share in God's Word together, though it has undoubtedly been different than any way we've ever done it before. We'll continue to keep you up to date on the situation involving church activities, and we'll stay in touch as best as we are able. Until then, again, draw strength from one another. Draw strength from God and His goodness toward us and the grace given in Jesus Christ. God bless you all.